is working, and he's always working. My father works still, Jesus said, and I'm working. The Lord is at work. Somebody asked me about the list of biblical terms that we got last week, and uh, we'll be posting them online uh, for those who have inquired about them, and uh, thank you for reminding us. We got an email reminding us, hey, can you post those terms? People want to see them, so uh, that would be good. And there's some questions there. We won't go through the questions, but um, I guess I could ask you, who's the restrainer and what is his role? Who is the restrainer and what is his role? The Holy Spirit is the restrainer. He's the catacon, the catacon. And what is his role? I guess his name kind of gives it away, right? <laughs> he restrains, right? He restrains the lawless one from appearing, and then he will be moved out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Uh, what is the day of Christ, or the day of the Lord? This is textual variation. The day of his wrath, that's right. The day of the Lord will be for the unbeliever. The day of Christ will be for the believer. It's the same day, but in one situation, the believers are comforted and lifted uh, to meet the Lord in the air, and... The day of the Lord will be for uh, the unbelievers, will be for those who reject the gospel and don't know God, don't obey the gospel, don't know God. What is the apostasy? A falling away. That's right. And we read from the context, Paul was speaking specifically for, that's right, believers. At one point, it went like this. And it's sort of a controversial thing because there are people that would say, well, that can't happen to believers. Well, that would, that would go contrary to what the word apostasy means. You can't fall away from something you never believed in. Uh, unbelievers never fall away. Unbelievers are called either pagans or unbelievers, or, or they're called, um, um, what's the other one that they use? Unbelievers. Gentiles, sometimes they're called Gentiles. Uh, basically, those who don't know God and don't believe the gospel. And the apostasy in verse 3. So all that to say, chapter 2, and we're at verse 13, and today, even though there's no chapter division, we're going to go through chapter 3, and we're going to go to verse 5. One of the things we have to really get accustomed to is try to overcome the barriers of chapter division. And what I mean by that is sometimes they create an artificial barrier where the original letter was not intended to have a break, in that letter, uh, it was supposed to be read flow through, right through it. And sometimes the chapter divisions, which came later, uh, basically around the Middle Ages, they decided to uh, have a way to categorize each chapter. And, and it was quite interesting how they did it. And uh, so by the time we got our translations, they had um, verses and chapters. But originally, these, these letters were read as one solid one solid letter, one solid flow. And the chapter divisions do help. They remind us where chapters are, and it's a good thing to do. And there, there's some positive and negatives, I guess, in cons and pros. Uh, but at the same time, sometimes they do block us from the natural flow of the letter. So let's read together verse 13 of chapter 2 and of chapter 3, uh, because in verse 6, it's a whole new thought that comes into play, and that will be next week. Paul now deals with the working aspect of the believer, what to do at work, and what to do when, in the church of Thessalonica, they stop working because Jesus was coming. They totally give up working. What's the point of Jesus' is coming? Why work? And they had misunderstood what Paul had said, and that starts in verse 6. But one thought together from chapter 2.13 all the way to 3.5. It's one thought as Paul is relating to them. 
But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by spirit and faith in the truth. And it was, and it was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Underline. Relating to something he's going to talk about later in the aspect of sanctification. Work and word. Always go together. Work and word. Like John would say, don't just love in word only, but also in deed. Right? That's the same thing Paul is referring to here. Our sanctification is always in word and in deed. Work, it's the aspect of the word erge, action. Not just good works. Like trying, We're not trying to be saved by good works, but we have good actions that comes from faith. Verse 1 of chapter 3. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified, just as it did also with you, that we may be delivered from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he'll strengthen and protect you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. And may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the perseverance or steadfastness or the faithfulness of Christ. Lots of ways to translate that, that final word. Steadfastness, faithfulness, loyalty, perseverance. It's a rich Greek word that we have to use all these English words to get the meaning of it. Let's pray. Lord, in the minutes, minutes that we have together, please give us your wisdom. Please give us your spirit. Please illuminate it to our hearts, Lord God, so we will not just hear it. We will not just study it, Lord, but we would put it into action as it commands us, Lord, to respond. Lord, you love us, and we're called to respond to your love. You called us, Lord, and you were called to respond to your calling. So please, Lord, help each individual here to love and good actions, to respond, Lord, to your calling in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for your encouragement. Thank you, Lord, for your calling. And may we have the courage and the power of the Spirit to do it, to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Paul has been referring to the day of the Lord, the day of Christ. We talked about that just a few minutes ago. And he related to us in a very, very straightforward facts from chapter 1. I'm sorry, from chapter 2, verse uh, 1 through 12, he gave us the facts. There's not a whole lot of good feel, feel good theology there, right? Verses 1 through 12, it was straight facts. Paul was dealing with their confusion. And their confusion is, what's going to happen when the day of the Lord comes? Are we in the day of the Lord already? Because they had a false spirit, which was like a word that came, like a false prophecy. They had a forgery, a letter that came as if it was from the apostles, and they also had bad teaching, false teaching. So false teachings, a false, uh, a false uh, prophecy uh, that was said, uh, a false spirit, and then a forgery, a false letter, all were playing a role in that church. And we remember what Paul was referring to them, that they should not quench the spirit, but to test all things, hold on to what is good, reject what is evil. Well, things have become so confusing in that church, that people didn't know what to believe. Some believed the Lord was coming at any moment for them, so they stopped working. Some believed that they were already in the day of the Lord. Uh, remember in the first letter, some believed that their loved ones who have died had missed, uh, were going to miss the coming of the Lord. And Paul had to straighten that out. They're not going to miss it. They're actually coming back with him. And we'll meet them in the air when they are resurrected and we are transformed. We are raptured at that time. Here, Paul's reminding them, you haven't missed the day of the Lord. You're not there yet, because <laughs> two things need to happen. That is, the mystery of iniquity has been working to lead people into the apostasy, and that the man of sin, the man of perdition, may be revealed. And that is the two things that are going to happen prior to the coming of Jesus. And we read that wonderful word, the parousia, the parousia, coming, the presence of Jesus. Uh, the apocalypse of Jesus, the revelation of Jesus. But remember, the man of sin, the man of perdition, 
is going to have his own parousia and his own apocalypses. He, is, he will be revealed, apocalypses, and he will be coming. That will be the parousia. He will have one just like Jesus. He's totally the, the antichrist. He's totally the one that will try to take the place of Christ. He'll have a, he'll have a parousia, just like Jesus, and he'll have an apocalypse, a revelation. The only difference is Jesus, when he appears, he's going to destroy him completely. And the brightness of his coming and comes forth the word of God from his mouth. But this man is going to replace Christ in people's hearts. He's going to give them all that they ever wanted, which was, is a world without God, a world without his law, a world without his truth, which is the world's already in that trajectory. They're already down that road, and he's going to come in and give them everything they ever wanted. If they wanted the world, they're going to get it. And that's the sad shame that people that really want the world, God is going to give them over to that lie. And it's quite interesting that all through the Bible, we see characters like this, like this man of sin that's going to come in. He'll be like Cain, the Bible says in 1 John. He'll be like the rebellious one, Nimrod. Right? His name means the rebellious one. He will be like uh, another character in Genesis, in Genesis 4, Lamech, right? who said, you know, Cain's going to be uh, avenged sevenfold, I'm going to avenge seventyfold. I mean, he was just a total rebellious man. He would be like Korah, rebelling against Moses, and Balaam. And he'll also be like Goliath, challenging the people of God, right? coming against the people of God. All through the Bible, we see just shadows and pictures of this man of sin, but ultimately he will be revealed, and then, suddenly, Paul turns to this, verse 13, and it's like the light shines out of this, this incredible truth that he's just given us. seems to be very hard-pressing. He says, now, I want to give thanks for you. Look at verse 13. I want to give thanks for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. It's like Paul turns, and now he says, look, the spirit of Antichrist is working in the world, leading people to lies, but there's the spirit of God who's going to lead you to the truth. And you see these two things working, these two spirits, in a sense, working in the world. The Holy Spirit drawing people to the Lord, convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, preparing the bride for the groom, preparing the bride for Jesus. But then the spirit of Antichrist, the mystery of iniquity, going forth and convincing people that the Antichrist is the answer, that lawlessness is the reality, that anarchy is what we need to go for. Paul writes, verse 13, there's something else. I want to give thanks to you, brethren. Because Jesus is the truth, because Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords, his parousia is going to be the greatest. And I think Christians should be the most optimistic of all people in the world. We know that there's something coming down the line. There's darkness coming, but there's great light ahead. And that's what we, as Christians, we never are just to give the grim facts. It is true. There's darkness coming. Darkness is already here. Uh, three quarters of the Christian world today lives in oppression of the spirit of Antichrist and, and other Antichrists coming against them. But there's Jesus coming, the light of the word. We're going to have this incredible glory appearing soon. But Satan's busy deceiving the world, causing people's hearts to fall away from God. And... This is rampant all throughout the world. But look at what Paul is going to say. God is working in this way. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification in the spirit and faith in the truth. God is working. And people oftentimes make this mistake regarding God at work. That means that if God is working, are we supposed to be doing anything? If he's the one at work, if he's the one working, and Jesus said, my father's working until now, and I am working, are Christians responsible, are God's people responsible for anything? And this has been the great battle, right, over church history over many, many years. It's what is the balance between God's sovereignty and his calling and his work, and then the responsibility of men? Is there any? Or is it all God? Or is it all men? And people have gone to extremes, and they have said, well, it's all God. That started with Augustine, right? It's all God. Man, have no, had nothing to do with this. Just leave it up to God. He'll do the work. He finishes everything, right? 
And then there were people who reacted to that, and they went completely on the opposite extreme. Said, "Well, no man, man's got a choice, and he's got a will, and he's got a, he's got to do the thing." And yet, there were always people, there were always Christians who saw them both ways. That there was a balance of the two, the sovereignty of God, absolutely undeniable. But then there's the responsibility of men, and I think in this chapter. Uh, we're going to take it a little bit different today. I can go through the whole summary and tell you verse by verse exactly what each verse means and things like that. But we're going to do a little bit different today because Paul is going to relate to those two things right there. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility from verse 13 to chapter 3, verse 5. And we're going to take it step by step relating to what is God's working and what is man supposed to do? Because there's a balance of the two, right? He says that God... It's the one who does the choosing. God does the choosing. And all through this chapter, we're going to see the free will of God. Right? God has free will. And there's no one more free than these three persons that make up the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All through this letter, all through these verses, I should say. You're going to see and, and I encourage you, because uh, this is a fun chapter. Highlight. Where is his Father, Son, Holy Spirit? They're all over the place. What's God's point in this, what God's calling is, and then you notice man's responsibility, because they're all intertwined there, and it's quite interesting. His first thing we, the first thing we see is his love, verse, uh, verse 13, his love, and he has given, he's given thanks to God because we're beloved of the Lord. This goes back to the Old Testament, by the way. Israel was the first to be called the beloved of the Lord. Deuteronomy 7, God says to Israel, I didn't choose you because you were great. I didn't choose you because you were awesome. I didn't choose you because you were the most talented. That's my own interpretation there. But I, did cho I chose you because I have loved you. You have been my beloved, and I loved you, and I chose you. It's a wonderful thing that God loved and chose Israel, not because they were great, but because he simply loved them. He just did. He just loved Israel. And he wanted to use them as a light to the nations. It's interesting that that same blessing is quoted again in the book of Deuteronomy, again, chapter 33, the blessing of Benjamin. And to Benjamin it's called, you are my beloved. You are my beloved. Uh, quite fascinating that the one who's writing this letter is a Benjamite, Paul the Apostle. He knew this verse very well. My beloved. Israel was my beloved. But who's the beloved here? He's writing to... That's right. He's writing to Gentiles. This is quite interesting, isn't it? When you see the Bible in its original intent, Jewish people who they believe were the love of the Lord, they were beloved of God, they were chosen of God, who are now introducing that same concept to Gentiles who were far from God, had no, they were far from the commonwealth of Israel, they didn't have a covenant, and yet God is referring to them as they are just like Israel. This would have been a tremendous blessing for the Jewish people, and for the Gentiles as well. Now, what is God doing? Let's look at his work, because he's doing something here. And by the way, he'll, he's going to do five things. Hopefully, we can, at the end of the day, we can see we're in God's hands, because he's got five digits, one, two, three, four, five, right? He does five things, and so we're going to be in his hands, so that's going to be good. First thing he does, he chooses. Now, here's the question, because there's a text variation. What is a text variation? Some of your translations are going to be read differently, so I'm going to explain that in a minute. Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. Now, the first thing we've got to ask is, what's the text variation? Some of your translations will have the first fruits for salvation. Some of your translations, like mine, will say, from, from the beginning. So is it from the beginning, or is it the, uh, the first fruits? It's either first fruits or from the beginning. Well, the oldest manuscripts has first fruits. So if you have an ESV, let me have an ESV. Okay. All right. All right. ESV says it. Okay. NIV says, okay. NIV will have the first fruits. If you have a King James or an NASB, it'll say beginning. Well, scholars argue about it, but it's the same, same rendering. <laughs> the idea is this, and here's a question What is the beginning? He has chosen you from the beginning. And this is where I'm going to disagree with Reformed theology. Reformed theology would say the beginning means before the creation of the world, before the foundation of the earth. There is nothing in this text that tells us that that is from the foundation of the earth. It just simply says the beginning. What is the beginning? Simply the time that they repented 
and believed in the Lord. How do I know that? Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The beginning, it's something Paul talked to them all the time about. In fact, when you were to read the eight chapters of this letter, of these two letters, five chapters in the first letter, three chapters in the second letter, so you have eight chapters together, Paul over and over again, it seems like a, uh, a thing that he had with them, he's reminding them the first day they met. Look at chapter 1, and look at verse 4. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, in full conviction, just as you know what kind of man we are proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators uh, of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation and with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Verse 9, for they themselves report to us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned, from, uh, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Uh, by the way, this is also discussed in chapter 2, in chapter 3, in chapter 4 of the letter, where Paul goes back to the time they met in the book of Acts, Acts 17. Paul's always referring to the fact that at one point, the beginning of their ministry in Thessalonica started. That's the beginning. Uh, if you go back to the second letter, we just add, look at verse 5 of chapter 2. Um, same, same chapter we were studying, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse 5. Don't you remember that I, when I was still with you, I was telling you these things? It's like Paul had this nostalgia about him. <laughs> he loved to go back and remind them of the time that they met. It's like this relationship, brothers, loved ones, right? Um, you know, just like you and your spouse or you and your uh, loved one, right? Didn't you always recall the day that you met? And if you have a good brother in the Lord, good sister in the Lord, and you just, you just go back to the time you met and just like, oh, it was wonderful. We went at that conference or at that church and we're at that prayer meeting. It's the same thing. Paul is reminding them that at some point they met. So let's go back to verse 13. That is the beginning. That is the beginning. God has chosen you from the beginning of the ministry, beginning of the Thessalonican ministry, for salvation, for salvation, through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Now, if it's the word for first fruits, I'll take the other translation. If the translation for beginning is first fruits, then it makes perfectly good sense because they were chosen to be God's people and Thessalonica, the first fruits. They were the first ones to hear the gospel and be saved in that whole area. They were the first fruits. God chose them to hear the gospel. There, for the, they were the first fruits to come to know the Lord in that area, to be the first to hear the gospel and to become part of God's family. They were chosen to do that. And it's a beautiful thing because they were the first fruits, meaning that more were to come, right? They weren't just the only ones. And this is the, this is the, the other problem that uh, I just want to address. Nothing in this text says that the other people were not chosen, right? They were chosen to hear the gospel and be the first fruits. But what about the other unbelievers? It doesn't say they were not chosen. It simply means that they were the, these Thessalonians were the first ones to hear the gospel in fact, we know that there is more coming because Paul prays for them and he encourages them and he says, I'm confident that you're going to do this. Spread the word of God all through that area. God's word is going to have speedy results all through that area. And we're to pray that God's messengers are not going to be deterred by evil men. So whether it's first fruits or whether it's the beginning, whichever translation you prefer or have, the answer is the same thing. God chose them to hear the gospel, to be the first ones in that area, to be saved or to have the first fruits, to be the first ones there. And they were not the only ones. There were more to come. But this was the beginning of Paul's ministry. When they heard the gospel, God chose them. And it's very specifically what they did, uh, what God did from the beginning. Right. So I'm, I'm 
very, very making it clear. I don't believe this is from the beginning of the world or the foundation of the earth. Otherwise, they would actually say that, like in Ephesians. We were chosen in him before the foundations of the earth. This doesn't say that. This is just his beginning. We have to find a question. We have to ask the question, beginning of what? And by reading the two letters, the eight chapters together, you'll find that Paul keeps going back, going back to that day that they met, the day that they heard, the day that they believed, and that's when they were chosen of God to be the first fruits. More to come. But it says they were chosen in the beginning, or the first fruits, for salvation. Now, it's quite interesting here. Salvation, we oftentimes think salvation the day somebody repented, the day somebody believed the Lord, and they became saved, right? That's normally how, when we say salvation, that's what we, we think, right? The way I think sometimes, right? But the Bible has three aspects of that same salvation, meaning that sometimes the Bible speaks salvation in past tense. We were saved. Sometimes it's speaking of salvation as it is now, and it uses the present participle, being saved, or continuous action, being saved. And then, over 40 times, uses this word to point to something in the future, something coming. Salvation is future. And more specified terms, I would put it like this. You were saved when you believed the gospel because God justified you. A holy God said to Roy and Frank, and bear that you are justified, right? You're not innocent, right? He didn't say you were innocent. He said you were justified. He didn't justify our sins. He justified the sinner. The person was justified because my son paid a penalty for your sins. I will declare you justified before a holy God. No sin as if you didn't do it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We know we did it. People remind us we did it, <laughs> but he forgets it. He forgets it. He willingly throws it in the sea of forgetfulness, and it's nothing. He'll never bring it up again. Isn't that wonderful? Whatever you repent of before the Lord, it'll never be brought up to you ever again. That's how faithful our God is. But now we entered into sanctification, and that's what Paul is referring to, the sanctification by the Spirit. That's the present tense being saved. You are being saved. If the Holy Spirit is sanctifying you, you are being saved. That means that it's ongoing sanctification. It's the word sanctification in the Bible. And then there's the future one. And it's the one Paul is referring to here. Glorification. You will be glorified when Jesus comes. At the harpezo, at the resurrection, at the anastasis, at the anastasis, you will be resurrected, you will be glorified in Christ Jesus. You will have salvation. How do I know this? Well, the Bible uses it many, many times, but I'm going to bring one verse to you, and maybe you'll remember this one, Hebrews 9. Let's turn to Hebrews 9 very quickly, just for exercise. So you're saying that uh, you never heard this before, or you're lying, or something like that. Let's look what the Bible says, right? Uh, because we have to check out the scriptures. We have to make sure that well, you do what Paul says. Let nobody deceive you, right? Let nobody deceive you. Look at Hebrews 9 and look at verse 28. The writer of Hebrews is finishing his commentary on the Old and New Testament. The New Covenant is here. The Old Covenant is passing away. The Covenant with Moses is passing away. The New Covenant is here, and it's better. And look what it says in verse 28, the last verse of the chapter. So the Messiah, Christ, also having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation. Wait a minute, I thought we had it. Well, yeah, you do. But he's also bringing it with him. Without reference to sin, to those who eagerly await him. How can Jesus be bringing something we already have? Because salvation is three aspects. You were saved, justified. You're being saved, sanctified. You will be saved, glorified. Now, here's the key part. Unless you're being sanctified, you won't be glorified. It doesn't matter if you were justified. Most people just stop at justified. And they say, oh, I'm justified. And they live in sin. And 
Some of them weren't even saved to begin with, but they, they live in sin. They don't understand. Uh, they go and grow on to discipleship. They don't continue in the Word of God. They never were sanctified, and therefore, unless you're being sanctified, you won't be glorified. Does that make sense? One more verse. Romans, Romans chapter 13, and this is probably one you've heard before because it's quoted many times as a wonderful encouragement. Look what it says. Romans 13, 11. Romans 13, 11. It says, In this do knowing, the time is already the hour for you to awaken. It is already high time, high noon. It's time for you to awaken out of your sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. How can salvation be near to us since we first believed? He's writing to Christians who already have salvation. How can salvation still be coming if we already have it? Is the Bible confused? No, the Bible is laying out a very clear doctrine in terms of salvation that is not just a once-in-a-moment situation that somebody got up at a crusade, rose a hand, and, and that's it, done. It's an ongoing process of sanctification unto glorification. As soon as you repent and believe, the Holy Spirit indwells you, and he begins the work of sanctification. Go back to 2 Thessalonians, because now it makes perfect sense what Paul is saying, this about this future salvation, because he says, verse 13, he chose you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification. Sanctification is the vehicle you have to get in the car. If I tell you, Roy, we're going to the mall, right? And uh, we're going to have to pick, uh, take your van. That's going to be the vehicle to take us there. Uh, we can't get there any other way except the vehicle that we chose. God has chosen a vehicle to get you to glorification. What is that vehicle? Number one, the spirit, the sanctification of the spirit, the changing internally of the person Onto Christ's likeness. You're becoming more like Jesus through the sanctification of the Spirit. And one more thing, and faith in the truth. You have to believe in the truth. You have to trust in the truth. Right? So God does this in a very, very wonderful way. He uses the Word and the Spirit, just like a lot of times in the Bible. The Word and the Spirit always go together. Always go together. Never separate them. I know circles of Christians that just, it's all the word. It's all the word. It's all the word. It's all intellectual. It's all in intellectual faith. And then none of the spirit, none of passion, no love, no real excitement for the Lord. And in other places, that's all they have. It's hype and excitement, but no truth, no word, no anchor for the soul. And it just becomes a lot of hype. You need both. And whenever God's sanctifying us, he'll be sanctifying us through the spirit and the word. Ephesians 6. Leave that 17. The Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, right? The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The Word always going together. Always together. The sword and the Spirit always go together. But that's God. He chooses. He chooses us to hear the gospel, and He appoints us to the salvation that's coming. Jesus is coming. How do I know that? Look at verse 14. And this He called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus. You're going to gain this glory, but it's coming, right? You don't have it yet. Chapter 1, when Jesus appears, apocalypse, you will enter into his comfort. You will see his glory. You'll be glorified in him. He appoints us to this salvation. He chooses us as Christians so that we can have the salvation through sanctification and faith in the word of God. That vehicle, got to get in the vehicle and got to drive the vehicle toward that glorification, right? And that vehicle is called the sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. You get in that vehicle, my friend, God has chosen that vehicle to take you there. You won't miss it. You won't get out of that. If you continue in it, you are going to be glorified. That's how God promises but he also does one thing also. Number two, he communicates to us. He communicates to us through the gospel. Verse 14, he called you through our gospel. See, now it's called our gospel. 
See, something God does, and it's sometimes we forget. It's his gospel, but he entrusts it to you. He gave it to you. In fact, the Bible calls the gospel a treasure. In Timothy, he calls it a treasure. He calls it a deposit, right? He has deposited something in you, which is far better than any and greater than any other thing you'll ever have in your life. It's the gospel. And that deposit is to be passed out, passed out to other people. It's to be passed around. It's God's gospel. He gave it to you, gave it to you, gave it to you, gave it to me, and he entrusts it to us so that we can share it and take it out to the ends of the earth. That's the treasure. And he links us, this gospel links us to the glory of Christ. He links us to the glory of Christ. When he comes, this glory will be yours because the gospel was given to you, you gave it to others, and by the gospel, you are linked to this glory. And we forget the glory, right? The glory that Moses said, can I see your glory? And God says, you won't be able to live. If I show it to you, you're going to die. I'm going to put you in this little rock. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Wonderful song that comes from that passage, right? God put him in this cleft of the rock so he could see his afterglow. And he could see his afterglow. But Paul had seen it, didn't he? Paul was the only apostle who had seen the ascended Lord. He's the only apostle who had seen the ascended Lord. All the other ones saw the resurrected Lord. Only Paul saw the ascended Lord with a glory brighter than the sun, he says. And he was blinded. And he says, oh, that glory. I remember that glory on the road to Damascus, and it's coming. And he's letting the believers know so they can get encouraged. You're not going to miss it if you stay on that vehicle. Number three, he encourages us. Verse 15, I'm sorry, verse 16, sorry, verse 16. Um, I said earlier, we're looking at the sovereignty and the responsibility of men. So we're looking at the sovereignty of God right now. We're going to come back to do the responsibility of man. So I'm going to skip a few verses here and there just to show you what God is doing and then go back and show us what he calls us to do. Verse 16, now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us an eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good action and word. Number three, what else does God do? He encourages us. He encourages us. You've been discouraged? Hopefully this verse lifts up your countenance. God has standards, and we can never meet it. He's a holy God, and we're not. And therefore, we cannot meet his standards. But does God lower his standards in order to get us in? He does not. So how can God live with me? How can I live with him? If he doesn't lower his standards, how can I live with the holy God who tolerates no sin? The Bible says Jesus came, born under the law, born under the law, to lift us. He lifts us above the law, right? He sets us free from the law. And he places us above the law because now he gives us his Holy Spirit and he puts us on top or ahead of the law. So the law is no more binding on the believer. Now the, I'm talking about the law of Moses because now we have a different law, the law of the Spirit. He lifts us, right? He doesn't lower his standard. He lifts us so now we can become like him through the Holy Spirit. And so this is the encouragement. Jesus came to lift people up. He didn't come to lower the standard of God. You ever read the Sermon on the Mount? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, boy, if you read it and understood it, you walk away with tremendous conviction. You go, who can, who can keep this up? Who can actually do this? And Jesus said, you have heard it said, Moses' law, you thought it was tough. My law, the true lawgiver, looks at the heart and the intention and the spirit of the law and it says, this is the standard. This is what my people are going to live by. And you go, how can I do that? He says, well, God does a couple of things. Look what he says. He says, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, so both of them working together, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort. All right, the word comfort there is um, urging you to go on. We think of comfort like, give me a hug. Here's a teddy bear. Here's some balloons. Hope you feel better. That's how we think of comfort. The Bible, the definition of comfort is it's, it's urging you to go on. It's like, 
come on, <laughs> let's keep moving. You ever had somebody, you know, maybe go on a hike or something like that in the, in the scout, the guy ahead is like, come on, everyone, let's go. Well, he's comforting you. I don't feel a lot of comfort when I got to climb those hills, but that's what he's doing. He's actually encouraging you not to stop and to keep coming, to keep going. And that's what Jesus does. He encourages in his grace, right? The grace, a good hope by grace. And then verse 17, he comforts us, same word encouragement, and strengthens your heart in every good work. This is really beautiful verse because there are two people involved in this. Did you read those two people? Jesus and the Father. But everything that they do, the way it's written here, every verb is singular. Even though there's two people, every verb here, like comfort, uh, strengthen, right? It's written in the singular form. Two people in a singular form. That's bad English, unless you're, God, unless you're the Trinity. <laughs> There's two subjects, but one singular verb, right? It doesn't make sense unless the two people are acting as one. They're believing as one, acting as one, doing as one of the same one, right? Like a husband and wife are supposed to be, right? They're supposed to be one. They're supposed to act as one. They're supposed to be in action and in, 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 uh, in mind as one. Uh, now, the Holy Spirit, the Father, and Jesus do the same. But here's Jesus and the Father acting as one to comfort us, meaning encouraging us, and to strengthen us. And the word strengthen there is used by Paul four times in this letter. He only used it two other times in his letters and the other letters. Here in Thessalonians, he uses it four times. Why does he do that? Because you're going to need it. You're going to need the encouragement because what were they going through? Tremendous tribulation, tremendous persecution, tremendous problems. Problems here, persecution there, difficulties everywhere. And Paul says, you're going to need the encouragement. And it's so wonderful, especially as we serve in ministries, to know that it's God who is in, who's comforting, encouraging. God who's moving people forward. Even when we don't think, like, man, I've, I told this guy 150 times already. <laughs> And you go, oh, after all that I've done and all that I've said, and it feels so hopeless. What do you mean? Does it go in this ear, out the other? You can rest assured that you're going to need the divine help. You're going to need God to do the encouragement. And he does. And he does. And he encourages and he comforts us and he strengthens us for every good work and, uh, every good work and word. And that's going to come into play in chapter 3, I already told you, because Paul is going to now deal with in chapter 3, their work. How are you doing in work? Now, the fourth thing he does is he protects us. Now, I'm going to jump to chapter 3 and look at verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Oh, this is lovely. God is faithful. This is the fourth thing he does. So we've already seen that he chooses. we already see that he communicates with us. we already seen that he encourages us. And now we're seeing that he protects us. God is faithful. This makes you want to cry when you read that verse. God is faithful. You ever met somebody so faithful? I'm at best. I'm at, that's right. <laughs> I'm at best unfaithful. At best, I am unfaithful. But God is faithful. And he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. He does two things. Did you notice that? He does two things. One, he strengthens you. When you're going to battle against the schemes of the devil, remember, you're in a hostile environment, hostile place, a very wicked enemy, facing a strong enemy, an invisible enemy, almost insurmountable situations that you're never going to win, and he's got strategies, and he's got schemes, and he doesn't sleep, and he's always plotting against us. How can you ever win? Well, there's the armor of God, the full armor of God, but he strengthens us. And then he debilitates the enemy because he protects us from him. He protects us from the evil one. Reminds you of the Lord's Prayer. Actually, the disciples' prayer, but it's called the Lord's Prayer, right? Talking about not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It actually should say the evil one. In the, in the Greek manuscripts, it actually says, I know in translations, deliver us from evil, but it's actually the evil one. Because evil comes from a person. 
That's the devil, right? Evil doesn't exist in a wall. Evil doesn't exist in a chair. Evil just doesn't float around in the air. Evil comes from a person, right? The devil, the originator of evil. He will protect us from the all spiritual host of wickedness, including the devil himself. Number five, he directs us. Look at verse five. And may the Lord direct your hearts into the love, into the steadfastness of Jesus Christ. When we need direction, when we need direction, God steps in and he gives us his word and he gives us uh, God's people around us. And this is what happens when we come to fellowship. We come to fellowship to realign our compass because we've been working. We've been doing all these things. And it's like a jungle, right? Wasn't there a song about that? It's like a jungle, something like that, right? Out there, right? It is true. It's nine to five. It's crazy. And, and the world has this tendency to chip away, doesn't it? To chip away at our faith, to chip away and to make us numb to God and his spirit. And then we go, I don't know which direction the Lord wants me to go. And then you come to church and you pray with somebody and you hear the word and you're like, oh, that's right. It's about Christ. It's about saving others. It's about bringing the gospel. It's about, this. oh, that's right. And he directs us. He redirects us, I guess you could say, into what? Two things that you're going to need. The love of God and the faithfulness or steadfastness or loyalty of Jesus Christ or the perseverance of Jesus, right? You will never have, you will never find a meaning of life until you have those two things the love of God, and the faithfulness of Jesus. Why both of them? Because if you only have love, it's just going to be up and down emotion. You ever wonder if God loves you? No? Yeah. You love me? Sometimes, hey, when you go through struggles, you know what happens when you're suffering? Does God really love me? It's the first thing the devil tries to get at us. He doesn't love you. If he loved you, you wouldn't be like this. Right? The love of God. But we also need something else. The faithfulness of Jesus, the perseverance of Jesus. When you got married, did they just say, hey, are you willing to love this woman or this man? Well, they didn't tell you to love them, right? They ask you, are you going to be faithful? At least they should have asked you. <laughs> are you going to be faithful to this man until death do us apart? Are you going to be loyal? Are you going to continue, right? Are you going to stay faithful? And so you need them both. Because if it's just, if it's just you know, loyalty, it's just a duty. I'm here. I guess I have to do this. right? That's sometimes marriage just what it becomes, right? I'm here. I can't divorce you, so i got to stay here. Right? A duty. Right? It is both. It is love and loyalty. The love of God that will endure and the perseverance that will continue. Right? And that's God's hand. That's God's fingers. Right? He chooses us. He communicates with us, he encourages us, he protects us, and finally, he directs us. Beautiful thing. You're in his hands, you got five things, you got five fingers, you'll never forget them because they're in your hands. But is that all there is? Some people tell me, well, since God's doing all those five things, it's wonderful. Don't have to do anything. Praise God. I press the elevator to heaven, and I'll get there very, very quickly, right? And some people take it as that, unfortunately. Um, the Bible places as much emphasis on God's sovereignty as it does man's responsibility, right? Don't ever think that way. Don't ever think that it's a travesty what happens to Christianity, where they're just overemphasizing one or the other at the expense of the other, and they just say, oh, it's all you. <laughs> if it's all me, man, this is weak. <laughs> if you have weak faith, right? I need God. But if it's all God, then... I what do, what do I need to do anything? I, I don't have to do anything. He doesn't ask for me anything. I press the elevator. I go to heaven, right? Nice and easy. Not so much, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's where it comes from, that idea. So what God says is this. No, it's like, an, it's, it's intertwined. It's like making potato salad, right? You know there are ingredients involved in it. Anybody know how to make potato salad? No? Okay. All right, good. You made it last night. Where is it? Right? <laughs> Uh, you can know the ingredients. You can understand the ingredients that are there, but they're interwoven together, and they taste so good together. Potatoes on their own, not so much. But you put them in potato salad, it does something, right? God's sovereignty is wonderful, 
But if it's not balanced with man's responsibility, it creates apathy and it creates just a wrong form of Christianity. In a sense, you need them both. And this is, they're so interwoven that we literally had to do this today. We literally had to take apart the verses and say, this is God's part. <laughs> and now let's look at our part. What does God ask of us to do? Well, he doesn't ask them to repent and believe necessarily because they're already Christians, right? They're already Christians. So that part, it's almost a given. That's already dealt with in the first chapter, in the first letter, that they had repented. They turned from idols, and they heard the gospel. But this is what God asks us to do. So I'm going to go back to verse 13 and just run through man's responsibility. Number one, faith in the truth. You have to believe in the truth and continue to believe in the truth. This is juxtaposed to verse 12, which has to do with the lie. Right? This is in contrast to those who believe the lie. Who are going to believe the lie? Those who are given over to that deluding influence. God gives them over to the lie because they didn't love the truth. But here Paul says, you need to have faith in the truth. You need to have faith in the truth. Number one. Number two, look at verse 15. So then, brethren, stand firm, and hold to the traditions which are taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Stand firm. Look at verse 2 of the same chapter. Because this is, Paul is answering the question, or relating to this point, I should say. Verse 2, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by spirit or message or a letter, as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So they were shaking, startled, like, you know, like an alarm. You were just shaking out of your composure. And here Paul says, stand firm. He's encouraging them because that's what's happening to them. They were getting all alarmed. The day of the Lord is here. We missed the, we missed the coming of Jesus. We're already in the middle of it. Stand firm. Don't worry. You're going to be okay. As long as you stand firm and you are holding on to the traditions which were taught, whether by mouth, I'm sorry, word of mouth, or by letter. The traditions. What is the traditions? You have a big question on this because we hear a lot about traditions. I like the more traditional churches. I like the more traditional hymns. I like the more traditional things. What is Paul referring to? Traditions. What is the tradition that he's referring to here? Simply, the apostles' doctrine. What the apostles said and did. What did they do? What did they say? How do they behave? That is our tradition. We don't go back to the church fathers. We don't go back to a denominational teaching or a denominational forum or a denominational organization. It's wonderful that God used them in their wonderful denomination throughout history. We always go back to what the apostles said, taught, and did. That is the basis of our faith. Our faith is apostolic. There are denominations whose faith is patristic, meaning that they came from either Augustine or church fathers. It needs to go back older than that, right? Our traditions go back older than that. What did the disciples teach? Then we hold to that. What did they do? Then we do that. What did they say? Then we preach that. That is a traditional Christian. That is what Paul is referring to. The traditions of the early church was what the apostles taught and believed. Did you notice here that it says, whether by word um, of mouth or by letter? Almost exactly what, chapter, what verse 2 said, that they got a wrong message, a wrong letter, and a wrong, um, a wrong message. But he doesn't say a wrong spirit. Does, I mean, he doesn't say by our traditions, whether by word or by letter. He doesn't say whether by word, by spirit, or by letter. He left out spirit from verse 2. Everybody catch that? I just want to make sure, I just want to make the point. Why doesn't Paul include spirit? Well, remember, it was a false spirit. It was a false word of prophecy that was misleading the people. And Paul says, now you're going to have the traditions, the word of God, what the apostles taught by word or by letter from us. Simply put, because when you have the word, you can test the spirit. When somebody stands up and says, I got a word from the Lord, and it's such so, a whatever, then 
you're to rule, according to Corinthians, you're to rule by the word of God and hold that into judgment, meaning that you hold it to the scrutiny of the word of God and says, did that violate scripture? Is that something from the Lord? Does, does it violate any principles of the Bible? Does it go against scripture? And if it doesn't and it passes the test, then you could accept it into the church as God speaking. Otherwise, out the door, right? Out the door. So that's what Paul is referring to here. Hold on to the traditions. Why? Because there's going to be a false spirit that's going to come and tell you something. And if you have it, if you have the word, you can test it. They weren't testing it before, and that's where they got into all sorts of trouble. So anyway, so that's set, stand firm. Number three, verse one of chapter three. Finally, my brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified, just as it did also with you, and that we may be delivered from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. If God is sovereign, why should we pray? You ever heard that? My people tell me this. I tell them, so don't let the devil box you into that thinking. That is absolutely wrong. Don't let the devil deceive you into that. If God knows what I'm going to need anyway, so why should I pray? Well, Jesus said, when you pray, you know the Father knows already what you're going to pray, but you need to pray. You need to communicate with the Father. You need to engage with God. Why? Because if you know what God is wanting to do, you already know that. Don't you want to participate in what God's doing? Don't you want to go, pick me, God, please me. I want to be involved in that. I want to be involved in that. So you pray. You pray because God is doing something, and it's our responsibility to pray so his will will be done. It's a wonderful thing that God interacts with us in his will through prayer. God is God. He's powerful. But he invites us into his prayer, and he says, will you pray for this? I want to get this done. Will you come and pray? Now, we don't twist God's arm. We don't tell God what to do. But doesn't he invite us into his, into his will? He just says, you pray. That's what he says here. You pray. You pray for two things. This is quite interesting. Number one, pray that the word of God spreads rapidly and be glorified, just as it, as it did also with you. The Greek word there is, may the word of God go as fast as it can. Now, that's really the Greek word, as fast as it can. Now, they didn't know anything about rocket ships or 1,000 miles an hour. They just knew the fastest way to get there was through horse. And this language here was the language of the Olympics, a runner, as fast as a runner can go. That's the word that Paul uses, as fast as a runner can go. How fast can it go? As fast as it can go. <laughs> How fast can you go? As fast as you can go. As fast as you can go, make the word of God go forth, right? Keep on running. Keep on running, and the language is to be glorified, or the word of God is to be glorified. Um, you're to pray that God's word takes rapid course throughout this world. I heard today from one of our brothers, I think it was Brad, that uh, the president was wanting um, to open up schools to have Bibles to be read. And my text was like, may the word of God go rapidly through this nation. Lord, please give us that window and just make the Bibles go everywhere and anywhere in the schools. And pray for those kids in the Huntington Beach who are wanting to pass out Bibles, but their school system is saying, you can't pass out Bibles. My prayer, Lord, let the word of God go forth. Make more people be more intrigued by it. What are they giving away? What are they doing? What? And then they get a Bible, right? Frank, you pass out Bibles. May the word of God have rapidly course, right? Amen. Right, uh, Brother Andre, Daryl, you guys pass out the word of God, right? Whether it's by word or by speech or by letter or by uh, uh, track, may the word of Christ have rapid course in whatever we do. And we're to pray for it, by the way. That means that we're to be looking for ways to get it out quickly. How fast can we get it out? Print, audio, media, audio, video, whatever you can think of. And we're to be praying for what to do. Number two, we're to pray for God's messengers to be safe. There's going to be human opposition. Verse two, that we may be delivered from perverse and evil man, for not all have faith. Literally, the faith or the faithfulness is not for everyone. For not all have faith. The faith or faithful, faithfulness is it's not for everyone. Not all are going to be faithful. Not all are going to have faith, right? And it's becoming very, very evident that the world has become more and more uh, opposed to the Word of God. 
and it's going to become fierce, and it's going to become more difficult, and the world's going to become more aggressive and defensive against the Bible and against the Word of God. So we're to pray that God's messengers are to be kept safe from people, from evil men, and from people who don't have faith, or it's not for them, so they turn against it. And we're going to be tested in this, by the way. We're going to be tested in this to see if we're loyal to the Word of God. Faithful. Faithfulness. Right? There's a test. And there's a test with your name on it. And a test with my name on it. To see if we're faithful to the Word of God. Israel was tested, wasn't they? They were, they were tested. They were tested in the wilderness. Forty years. It took them two and a half weeks. Forty years. It was a test. And they kept taking the test over and over and over again. And that's what could happen to us. We take that test and we go, man, I saw that bush a year ago. Same one. Still there. And why am I seeing it again? Because you have not completed your test. That means you keep bailing out of it. God puts you in a test. Lord, get me out. And you bail out. Guess what? You're going to have to take it again. <laughs> You're going to take it again and again until you know how to be faithful in that, right? Israel was tested. As soon as they didn't see Moses, Moses, where's Moses? He's been around for like 39 days or something. Aaron, <laughs> get, the, get the cow. We have to worship God. And they call it Yahweh. And they fail that test. So develop into a massive orgy and all kinds of just weird stuff that they were involved in. Why? Not all have faith. Not all have faith. And Paul's saying these there's going to be perverse men, even people that claim to have faith. But they're not going to have faith. That means that God's going to have to protect us even from those who seem to be of the faith, but don't have faith. They're not really loyal to God. Number four, and last one, look at verse four. And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, that you are doing and will continue to do what we command. What's number four? What's our, what's our fourth one? Obedience. Obedience. You know that word that uh, kids hate and, and sometimes wives don't like? Obedience, right? Submission, obedience. Well, we all are to be obedient. So we're called to do faith. Number one, faith and trust in the word of God. Stand firm, number two. Pray, number three. Obey, number four, right? We have confidence in the Lord that you are going to do this. How can I be faithful? How can I continue to be obedient? How can I, in a disobedient world, how can I stay obedient? I have confidence in the Lord. That's what it says, right? Confidence in the Lord concerning you. I have no confidence in myself. <laughs> I have no confidence. I'm not very impressed with myself. Right? I am not very impressed with myself. I have confidence in the Lord. It has to be the Lord. How can you stay obedient, raise obedient children, unless you have total confidence in Christ that he will do it, right? How can I continue to be consistent? Because Christ is consistent. Because Christ perseveres, and he's encouraging us to go, right? That's our responsibility. We are to believe, we are to stand firm, we're to pray, right? And we're to obey. Sounds simple. Go do it, right? Is that all that's to it? Basically, by the help of the Holy Spirit, you go and you have confidence in the Lord to teach others about it, right? When you bring somebody to faith in Jesus, your job just begun, right? When you bring somebody to faith in Jesus, your job just begun. Now they got to get baptized. Now they got to get discipled in what Jesus said. You go with them. You disciple them and you teach them all that I have commanded you, right? And I'll be with you even till the end of the age. You'll be with us. But we have to teach, and we have to conform to his will and teach people how to conform to his will, how to stay obeying the Lord, how to stay obedient, confidence in the Lord. So what's the point as we finish? If God does it all, why should I do anything? If God calls me to do something, then is it all on me? The answer is in this simple illustration. I was looking for batteries today. I remember this. Couldn't find batteries. Double A's. Anybody got some? And it's like a battery in the back. Yeah. Uh, it's like a battery. What do you mean, battery? The sovereignty of God and the responsibility of men is like the polar opposites. It seems to be the polar opposite, a minus and a plus. But where you balance them together, like a battery, it creates 
the right charge to empower whatever you need. People that go into extremes, it's all God's sovereignty, or it's all man's responsibility, they become powerless. The power is when you hold them together in tension, and you find the polarity. It's called polarity. When you find the polarity, how do I know it works? Well, I have a battery pack that functions through batteries, and it's propelling this microphone. And I know it's working because it's, my voice is coming through the speakers. Some people say, oh, how can I understand that the sovereignty of God, responsibility of men, how can I believe it? How can I hold to it? It doesn't make any sense. You know what? It's far above our head. I will be in all humility to ask you, I don't under, fully understand how it totally works. I don't. To try to philosophy it, I won't bore you the details. People have tried to do this. And it's beyond our capacity. His ways are above our ways. But he just tells us, look, it works together. And how do you know? Live it, and you'll see how it's supposed to work. How do you know the polarity works? Because my microphone's working. <laughs> my battery's working because my microphone's on. How do you know God's, God's sovereignty and responsibility of men work? Live it. You're supposed to live it, and you'll know it. You'll know it with absolute doubt that this is absolutely how it's supposed to work. God is at work. We praise him for it. And God is asking us and urging us to, enjoy, to not only enjoy him, but to join him in his work, his work of evangelism. And as we go out, as the Thessalonians were to go out, right? Paul said, I'm confident. You're the first fruits. I'm confident that the word of God is going to go rapidly all through that area, and you're going to be the one propelling the word of God to these people, and there's more to come. And those persecutors of yours, they're going to be your church members. <laughs> They're going to be the, your church friends. They're going to be the ones next to you. And you know, you go, oh, Pastor, that can never happen. Have you heard the testimony of the persecuted church where the pastor, is, his assistant pastor is the guy that tried to kill him? Uh, or in the church, there's believers that used to be attacked by uh, uh, Muslims, and they came to faith in Jesus, and now they're enjoying together and fellowship together and praising the Lord together. That's what happened when people began to take God serious. And they began to spread the word. God did the work. But it took men and women to be faithful to God because he's faithful. And then God did it. We're called to persevere in it. Thank God for the love of God. Thank God for his perseverance. And that's what we're called to do. And to the love of God and the perseverance of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your grace tonight. May your Holy Spirit make this real to us. Through your love and your grace. We praise you. We honor you, Jesus, because you're going to do the work. He who started a good work in us is faithful to complete it. And Lord, you urge us and you call us into this, into your work, co-laborers in the field of faith, co-laborers into the world that you're working in, bringing people to Christ. Lord, I thank you that you called us and you found us faithful and worthy to be put into the ministry. Lord, I, I would never put myself in it, but Lord, you called us all into the service of you. And so, Lord, praise you for your wisdom. Praise you for, uh, Lord, your grace that even though, Lord, we can be faithless, you are faithful, and you empower us to be faithful, and you lift us up, Lord, and you encourage us, and you give us your grace and your spirit so that we can know the direction we're to go. So, Lord, we pray that we will have a true change of heart and what our responsibilities are. Lord, I know you'll do the work, and I know you have already started. My father's at work, Jesus said, and he's still working, and I work, Jesus said. So Lord, help us to work alongside you, calling us into your field, and making our lives worth, Lord, living through you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Any questions?